Hello gang, welcome back to the channel. I hope you're really doing great. As you probably know, I have already made a video detailing how I trained for my first Ironman, what I learned, etc. And this video is going to be a follow-up to that. Having just completed Ironman Tallinn 2022 with a time of 10 hours and 18 minutes, a PB by a full 1 hour and 15 minutes, I would like to share with you and detail how I managed to take so much time off my personal best. In this video, I'm going to do my best to share with you exactly all the data and metrics that I used, how I devised my training plan, hours per week trained, specific training sessions in swim, bike, run, and some of the biggest takeaways from this training journey. I believe watching both the previous video that I made and this one possibly could avoid you so many mistakes and help in dialing in your own training. Many things in this video are more advanced, but the training principles on how to build and increase your aerobic engine, allowing you to progress up in both time and distances, I can say remain firmly the same. I hope this video is of value to you along in your journey. If you're new to the channel, my name is Patrick. I am a recreational, very enthusiastic endurance athlete. And right now I'm focusing my efforts on the Ironman distance. I started out completely from scratch and I progressed my way up through 70.3 and eventually Ironman. I fell in love with endurance sports and in particular Ironman for the way that it quiets your mind and it allows you for deep self-meditation, self-work and how it can really build your fitness in a way that can allow you to do so many other different things. Hiking, running, ultra running, ultra cycling, you name it. Ironman is what can prepare us to do all of these things. So before starting with the training, there is one question that needs to be answered. Why do an Ironman? And there is no one single answer, but I believe that whatever your personal reason might be, there is some sort of magnetic pull towards doing this grueling event. It has something special, I believe, that attracts people who desire a challenge or have something to prove to themselves or something to prove to other people. They want to self-transcend or it can be so many other reasons. For me, personally, it started as a statement to myself that I would never go back to what I was in the past. And now it has progressed into a very introspective and kind of like a personal development journey, both in the training and in the racing. The training provides a unique set of circumstances that allow for deep internal self-work. An elevated heart rate, but without the intensity being too hard, helps me clear my mind and work on myself, especially in identifying what I really want to do with my life. It also brings a lot of joy to my life. I love riding, exploring, challenging myself and redefining what I thought was possible. And this time I think I approached the training even better because I made it more fun. Instead of solo rides on the tri bike, when I could, I opted for epic rides with friends or solo in the Italian Alps. I strongly believe in learning by experience and only then sharing what I think could be good tips, advice and information that I've tried and tested on my own skin. And this is why I'm making this video. For some context, I started training for triathlon in 2018, starting from zero background in any of the three sports, apart from cycling where I would commute in the city and running I had done maybe six or seven kilometers. I did my first Olympic distance and 70.3 in 2019 and my first full distance in 2020. And then I kept on training. I fell in love with riding my bike, running and trail running. Swimming, not so much, but it's a sport that gave me so much. I really respect how good it can be for our bodies and our minds. I am self-coached, but I do rely on advice from a handful of key figures and mentors who I gravitate towards to for knowledge. I have also been lucky enough to spend some time with elite professional Ironman triathletes and coaches, as well as Kona qualifiers, and had access to see how these guys train and operate. What happened after I did my first Ironman is I trained super hard to do another one the next year. But then I had COVID, and then pericarditis and had to skip all events in 2021, which reduced my fitness dramatically, as you can see from the graph in training peaks. And after all that, I suffered a really annoying Achilles tendon injury, which took me out for another three full months of no bike and no run. This had never happened to me in the years of training for endurance. I was in a really bad spot, but it's great for this video because I can show how I rebuilt my fitness from basically zero up to getting to a 1018 Ironman finish time. Nothing spectacular, but for me, a solid effort, I believe. And I also believe it holds value because it was performed on the same exact course as the first one and with similar conditions, resulting in a one hour and 15 minute improvement to the previous attempt, which shows, in my opinion, that this training can really work. To 
start off, I would like to share with you the data that I use to train because the data is critical. Specifically, I used pace and critical swim speed in the swim, power and heart rate on the bike, heart rate, pace, and limitedly power on the run. I also introduced glucose monitoring with Super Sapiens for all the disciplines and the recovery. This data was provided by a Garmin 945 GPS watch, Garmin HRM Pro heart rate strap, four eyes power meter for power on the bike, and a Brighton 750 by computer for speed on the bike. On the run, I use the HRM Pro strap, both for heart rate and for power. What gets measured gets managed is the motto, but I personally do not mega obsess over doing specific precise intervals, opting more to do like, let's do this climb hard and then recover on the downhill or fat leg style running. I performed zero of my training indoors, neither bike nor run. And for sure, maybe I could have built more fitness that way, but I prefer to train outside and enjoy the whole experience. Either way, also outside, data is really helpful to have a clear picture of if you are progressing or not, because overall the trend needs to be of a progression, and this can be done with data you collect outside, no problem. The fundamental principle for the whole training was 80-20 or polarized training, 95-5. This was carried over from the previous training build I had done for my first Ironman, and I believe it works very well. 80-20 or 95-5 means 80% of the training is moderate zone two efforts and 20% of the time is higher intensity stuff. This can be pushed to an extreme with 95.5 polarized training, where it's the same thing, but it's 95% easy and 5% hard. The 5% in polarized is really gut busting all out effort. I chose 80-20 predominantly because the closer I was getting to the race, I would perform some longer efforts like for example, a 100 kilometer time trial, which would be at a higher intensity. The absolute key metrics that I used were intensity factor, training stress score, and heart rate. To get these metrics working correctly, it requires to figure out your power and heart rate zones, which can be done for power with the 20 minute all out test and for heart rate with the max HR test. Once you have those numbers, these metrics become fundamental to figure out pacing. And pacing is the most critical aspect of a race as long as an Ironman. Knowing what pace we can really sustain for a five plus hour bike ride that will allow us to then sustain a marathon in a decent way is very, very important. To dial in the pacing, I specifically used intensity factor, possibly the most important metric of them all. It is basically the ratio between your FTP and your normalized power for the ride, expressed in a decimal number. An intensity factor of one means one hour at FTP, so uh, an all out effort. Common values for intensity factor for an Ironman bike split can vary from 0.67 to 0.8, with the higher value being what basically the pros do, whereas a lower value is what we as age groupers can do. Training is the place to practice this pacing and understand what we can sustain so we can avoid blowing up on race day or underdoing it. These charts are just charts. So everything needs to be tested and tried out on ourselves because everything is very, very personal. For example, you might be able to hold a higher power for a long period of time, but your FTP might be low. So there is so many different variables and it needs to be tested out. One thing that I completely changed this time was to get help from an app. I got help from training peaks and especially training stress score and the performance management chart. I did a bunch of research while I was figuring out how to improve my fitness and my training. And I found this super interesting article on the training peaks blog that showed the amount of weekly TSS needed, or at least advised to be able to complete or race various events including Ironman. So basically my plan was hitting as high as a number as I could without injuring myself or burning out. The performance management chart was my Bible. I monitored especially these values, TSS or training stress score. It's the basics of the data calculations for training peaks train. All the disciplines have this metric and it provides the ability to quantify any workout based on an intensity and a duration. A 60 minute all out effort equals 100 training stress score. And efforts at a low intensity will provide TSS values lower than that. CTL is the chronic training low. Basically it's what is called the, your current fitness score. It accounts for your past six weeks of TSS workouts and the more recent ones impacted more than the ones you performed earlier. This score should be consistently trending up, but it is not absolute. Always on the Training Peaks blog, there is an article that shows some reference values for what it should be when approaching different races and what to aim for. ATL is the acute training load. It's a very important metric and Training Peaks gives some guidelines on what values you should be careful of. This value basically signifies how 
tired and wrecked you are. <laughs> Basically, that's what, it, that's what it means. One thing to note is that even though I monitored the PMC chart like a religion, I did really push what my body could handle, taking some pretty big risks. I would not advise you to ramp up so fast to a race. It is actually really not advised on the Training Week's blog. But I just kept on testing and listening to my body really a lot and it just felt natural and doable to ramp up so fast. Personally, if I could go back, I would take the total TSS performed over the course of four months and I would spread it out on at least one or two months more of training. That being said though, I was definitely not reckless and I was very careful to listen to my body and I would encourage everyone to do so. A plan is always a good plan on paper, but being able to adapt the plan to what real life things happen, having to work at odd hours, which means little sleep, or having to travel, being sick, I believe is key. I had no problem in taking an extra day off here and there, making up for it by doing the scheduled sessions for the day on another day when I felt great, or even just skipping them, basically. So now we come to creating the actual plan. I divided the plan into different phases. One general prep aerobic phase, one extra long phase and one race simulation phase. Then I concluded with a two week taper. These phases, like the first time that I trained, consisted of three weeks progressively getting harder with more training load every week and then one recovery week where I dropped the volume. Every week the sessions should become harder or longer. For long distance triathlon, I focused on making them longer because that is what the race entails. For the very last section, being short on time, I actually did a two week build heading into a two week taper before the event day. Ironman training requires a lot of time, this is no secret, both weekly and in the necessity to build up along months progressively. A big problem that I had was in 2021, I had trained really a lot, but then I had suffered from COVID pericarditis, which took me out two months, and then the Achilles injury, which took me out until the end of 2021, with zero cycling or running happening. On a positive note though, I did go to the gym quite a lot, and I worked on both my lower body and my upper body, which I think paid off in the end, but I had to face the fact that I was out in the two main sports. I could take maybe being out from running by being injured, but not from cycling. Cycling is the most fundamental part of the puzzle. So basically, my fitness went down to almost zero. It was really incredible and I couldn't believe it. But then I made it a priority to get back into training and I started cycling very easily in January 22 and progressed through February. But training was still pretty sporadic because I would get flares up in my Achilles tendon. The real turning point was around March when I went to Thailand and the Achilles tendon started getting significantly better. Here I started thinking about triathlon training again and I kind of started with the first phase, base. For this first general aerobic prep, I was in Thailand and all I focused on was swimming in the sea, cycling on my gravel bike and hiking since I was still dealing with my Achilles injury. My only objective was to get some base back in. So all I did was to do as many training sessions as I felt like during a week and trying to slowly build up some fitness. I went on road rides around Phuket, I went into jungle gravel rides with a power meter, I hiked up mountains in the middle of Koh Phangan, and all I tracked was the total time per week spent in zone two or above, aiming to get back to a solid six to nine hours per week. Being that this went really well, I decided to try and train kind of seriously again. I restarted training more with power and data in mind, still in Thailand and still on my gravel bike, but I started running and swimming a little bit more in the sea. I then decided to return to Europe because I could see potentially being able to be at the start line of an Ironman in a near future. So I came back to focus really a lot on training. The bike was going to be my main focus, just like the first time. I find that prioritizing the bike, as it is the longest section of an Ironman, it's the one place where most improvements can be made, both in fitness and aerodynamics. Nailing the bike intensity and nutrition I found to be key to be able to set up a good marathon performance. My previous bike split had been 5 hours and 35 minutes, so a 32 kilometer average speed. So I was trying to get as much of a fast time compared to this, both in training and with aerodynamics. The aerodynamics portion I will cover in the race recap video, coming soon, in which I will detail all the gear that I used. 
For the bike training, generally the guidelines that I followed were like this. One day hard, one day easy, one day hard, one day easy, and one day long. Hard means sessions with intensity. This time I did almost zero short interval work and did mostly 12 to 20 minute blocks at a higher intensity. I would define these as tempo rides with varying blocks with different lengths depending on where I was in the train. In the beginning, it might have been two blocks of 12 minutes, usually performed outdoors on climbs, and they got progressively longer, with a couple of times doing some 30 to 40 minute blocks at a higher intensity, for example, on the Col des Oarts climb in France. These rides were performed mostly on climbs during the first phases, and then the closer I got to the race, the more I would do these sessions, and actually all the sessions, on my TT bike and on flatter courses, getting used to pushing the same watts on flat, and getting very used to the position of the bike, which I think is very important. The long ride would be on a weekend day, usually Saturday, and would be a zone two effort. A lot of the times I made these super long rides fun by going on epic mountain rides to France on my road bike. And I believe that that was a pretty good choice because it made it just so enjoyable. Still suffering, all the same. It was very hard, <laughs> don't get me wrong, and I had to face some really, really tough moments on these rides, but they were just so awesome and it was just so epic to get outside and ride these amazing places. Then the closer that I got to the race, the more I would do long rides from 130 to 180 kilometers on the TT bike and on similar courses to the race course. Train specific to your race. I believe it's a very important concept. This was, yes, a, a lot more boring, let's say, even though it was still enjoyable, I still enjoyed it, but it was very, very productive and conducive to being super comfortable at just being on the TT bike and going for hours. For swimming, I was very simply going to focus on being able to swim the distance comfortably and without gassing out. Very simple, I was not looking to make almost any gains in the swim because it would have cost me so much time and effort and it was basically time that I didn't have. For run training, I was going to focus on building as much endurance in my legs as to carry me over for the full distance of the marathon, but keeping the run volume at a minimum effective dose and without doing any intensity so as not to tax the joint. So it was basically all aerobic runs, some shorter, eight kilometers, some longer, up to 25 kilometers. I got back to Europe and I went in full monk athlete mode. I completely dedicated myself to training. All I did was eat, train and sleep, basically. I decided really to dedicate as much time as possible to this goal, taking on as little work as I could and doing mostly editing or animation gigs that I could do from my home, so I could basically work from home. And I only went out on shooting jobs uh, around five days in around two months, so that is very little. I understand that this is something of a luxury and that not many people can do this, especially people who are juggling with a really full life, kids, family, and work. I will elaborate further in the video what I would suggest to do if you have other commitments, but basically I would just reduce the number of hours per week to what you can manage and fit in and spread the build out over a longer period of time to accumulate the same total TSS and hitting the same end sessions, but on a longer stretch of time, taxing work and family life a lot less. After having done this build, I truly believe that training needs to always be a positive thing in our life without letting it take over if we have other commitments. We are not professional athletes, so I always try and keep in mind what Ironman training represents for me. Structure, consistency, self-development, health and fitness. Even though I trained a lot, I always made sure that it brought joy to my life. And the only moments that I found really hard were a couple of weeks where the volume was really high, like 19 or 22 hours. And there it was tough, but it was just a moment that I decided I, I would just focus on and get it over with. So to elaborate further on this and give you more in-depth insights on the training, I would like to share with you a sample training week in Europe. So this would be the sample training structure with no specifics about the sessions. Mondays would be off, and I believe this is a must. And if you have any desire to do anything on a Monday, apart from maybe some light mobility work, I think, personally, I thought I, I wasn't training hard enough or long enough, basically. Monday, I really take it as a sacred day for rest, and I find that really I have no desire to get on a bike, go for a swim, or on a run. Tuesday would be an easy bike or a tempo bike. Wednesday, a swim at a high intensity and a bike at a higher intensity. Thursday would be bike super moderate and a run, kind of like a tempo run maybe, but not really, just pretty easy run. Friday, 
easy bike preparing for the weekend. Saturday would be a massive long bike and Sunday would be a long run, often done as a brick with one hour bike before and I would swim the distance, so 3,800 meters. The swim could be switched out to a Saturday but I did them on Sunday because Saturdays were really long epic rides for which I would leave around 6 a.m. and I would come back in the evening so I didn't really have any time to squeeze in a swim throughout the day basically. This structure is basically the same as I had already detailed in other videos. The only thing that I changed was to have a kind of easy day on Tuesday if I needed it. I quickly realized that I could not really handle a hard day after the massive volume done on the weekends so I, I kind of took Tuesdays kind of mellow. Another thing that I took from previous training was focusing on the bike volume and keeping the run volume to the minimum effective dose as I said before. To still be proficient on the marathon distance but without taxing the joints too much. Running long distance can be really brutal on the body and I've learned the hard way about how much I can handle per week without getting injuries or niggles. What I did to mitigate this risk as I've detailed in videos before but still keep the volume up would be to do a one hour hard bike very leg-based muscular effort followed by the run. This was done to simulate some extra run volume, some extra leg fatigue, but without the impact. A key thing is to remain injury-free. That is absolutely paramount. You lose all the races you can't show up to because of an injury. And in something so high volume as an Ironman, the risk is always there and must be taken into consideration especially since the volume creeps up really a lot in the final phases. It's also important, I believe, to listen to our body and if we need extra recovery to help with the schedule. It's way more important to stay injury free and to not overreach too much or overtrain than to obsess over hitting that session on that specific day. I really had no problem in taking an extra day off or in throwing a session out of the window. I would like to share with you the longest session so we can get a general idea of where the end is. So the longest swim was 3,800 meters continuous. The longest bike I did was 200 plus kilometers with 4,400 meters of elevation and the longest run I did was 25 kilometers with a focus on the final five kilometers feeling strong and picking up the pace. Absolutely key sessions that I would advise anyone to do would be a 3,800 meter continuous or almost maybe with one break swim, a 180 kilometer kind of like race pace bike plus a mini three kilometer run after or a 110 kilometer ride plus a 15 kilometer brick and I would advise anyone to do at least 25 kilometers for the long run. I think that is a very short distance actually to train for a marathon. Another concept that I carried over from last time's training was the key weekend. This weekend is a sort of a race simulation focusing on TSS. I learned this principle from the Endurance and Pursuit of Potential podcast and it basically is simulating 80% of the race total TSS in a compressed period of time, Saturday and Sunday, where one would do full swim distance slash TSS plus full bike distance slash TSS plus 60 to 70% of the run distance slash TSS. So this specifically looked like Saturday, extra long bike ride, epic ride in the hills, nine hours, followed by minimal recovery. Sunday, I woke up super early and I did a one hour bike, muscular effort, very hard effort, plus a long run brick, followed immediately by 3,800 meters continuous swim. Average time training in the first part was 7 to 12 hours per week. In the final build it was 16 to 19 hours per week with the biggest training week being 22 hours. Total training time for July, the month before the race, the biggest month ever in my life was 81 hours of swim bike run. Now I would like to dive into two sample weeks. I would like to show you the first week of structured training, so to give you a starting reference point, a baseline. And then I would like to show you the biggest week of volume. So you can potentially, having these two elements, reverse engineer everything in the middle and adapt it to your own training schedule from these numbers, knowing how much time you have available. So the first week, the baseline week is Monday off, as always, Monday is rest and recovery. Tuesday was swim in a pool, 3000 meters subdivided into 300 meters warm up, easy, 
300 meters technique with a pull boy and a snorkel focusing on catch and hand entry and gliding. And then it was six by 400 meters at an aerobic pace. Bike, two hours, mostly easy with some higher efforts up hills. Wednesday was a one hour. It could also be 90 minutes bike, but easy. And then some core work. So plank, side plank, activating all the muscles in the core, and then maybe some kettlebell work or some elastic band works just to activate the muscle, not really overloading them too much. This session would be, it could be 15 minutes, it could be 30 minutes, depending on what I was feeling. Thursday was a bike 90 minutes with hills and intensity and a seven kilometer run. Friday was one hour bike, super easy. Saturday was a seven hour and 30 minute bike with climbs at an aerobic zone two effort. So a moderate effort, nothing crazy. Sunday was a 2,200 meter open water swim, all aerobic with pauses every 800 meters and then a 10 kilometer run at an aerobic zone two pace, basically at a go all day pace without getting to high intensity without fatiguing myself. And now I would like to share with you what the biggest week of volume looked like. This week was performed three weeks before the event. Monday, completely off recovery, totally not doing anything, especially at this point where everything was piling up. If I have energy to train on Monday, it means I am under training during the week, just my opinion. Tuesday was first off a swim, a one hour and five minute swim in the pool, 3000 meters divided into 500 meter blocks, swimming at a higher than race pace effort. If you want to work on specific things on a long distance, some of these blocks I would perform with a pull buoy or a snorkel or paddles or even all three together. But I would swim at least half of the distance freestyle, no tools. This was followed by a one hour and 20 minute bike ride with one hour hard at a really uncomfortable effort, an effort that was not sustainable for, could have maybe kept it up for another 15 minutes, but nothing more than that. Wednesday, one hour bike, easy, complete, easy. Nothing hard about this bike, just getting out and pedaling. Thursday was an 8.5 kilometer run at an aerobic pace, but not really go all day pace, just like a slightly high intensity, just slightly harder than a very easy pace. Friday, four hour time trial on the bike. The objective of this, of this ride was to go at a higher intensity than race pace for four hours to get A, comfortable with a higher intensity effort sustained for a long period of time and getting to know what that feels like and B, what I mustn't do in a race because I would blow up if I rode at this intensity. I ended up covering 127 kilometers with 900 meters of elevation with a normalized power of 214 watts and an intensity factor of 0.85, way too high. I knew I had to ride below the threshold and I knew what overbiking meant with this session. This ride was performed with the time trial bike. Saturday was a mega epic 202 kilometer ride in the Italian Alps with my road bike with 4,400 meters of elevation just focusing on getting on the climbs in zone two. I rode some epic calls and the first one was Col Daniel, a 2,500 meter continuous climb over 60 kilometers, then Col di Zoar, followed by Passo del Monginevro to come back to Italy. The objective of this ride was to get as much time pedaling possible, building as much fatigue and mental strength as possible. There were some really tough moments in this ride, especially Izoard at 1 p.m. in the afternoon was really, really brutal. Sunday was an early wake up call with a one hour hard bike, muscular effort, followed by my longest run, 25 kilometers. The objective of this brick session was to simulate some muscle fatigue in the legs as I have detailed before on the bike by riding hard with a lower cadence, strong effort, and then running at zone two with some race pace blocks. 25 kilometers, is a fairly short distance, but I had read online about many people not going over 27 kilometers in train. And I think in this case, it was a good idea to avoid injury. The focus of this run performed in Hoka Bondis entirely on flat trails with some uphills and downhills to simulate the race course was to get up to 20 kilometers feeling strong and charging the last five kilometers with the goal of ending still having energy in the tank. Duration of the run was two hours and 21 minutes. Intensity factor was 0.71 and average HR was 142 and it really felt great. This run was also a great opportunity to practice nutrition. So I practiced getting in as many carbs as I could. I think I ate 250 grams of dates during this run and I got them in zero problems. I would stop at fountains and just get some water and drink it and it worked out really great. 
Straight after the run, I changed out of my clothes and went directly to the pool where I jumped in and I did 3,800 meters continuous swim, no breaks at anaerobic pace. And this turned out to be a 1 minute and 57 second per 100 meter swim. After this weekend, something happened that had already happened the time before. It was like a switch flicked. I'd already experienced this. After this weekend, it was like doing impossible things like training at such a high volume in so little time didn't seem anything extraordinary anymore. It felt normal. And this happened especially just before the swim because I was going to the pool, I just dived in and the thought of swimming 4K nonstop, something that even just two months before would have been something that I dreaded pretty hard. And this time it just felt normal. It felt easy. It was just something that basically needed to be done. And at this moment, I realized I was ready to race. At this point, this was the 18th of July. I signed up for Ironman Tallinn. That was going to be the 6th of August. I don't think I will ever sign up for a race months before because there is just so much stuff that can change in work, life, opportunities. And I much prefer to sign up late when I feel that the circumstances are all really good. Even though this time there was going to be a surprise in that, but it's going to be detailed in a coming video. Hey guys, so I've just been editing the video and there is something that is key that I think I forgot to say before. And that is the time frame for this whole training started in January and February with very little training because I was still injured. It progressed into March with slightly more training and then April, May, like the base phase and then June and July as the really focused build phases. And what I would like to add to the video is that I thought I was starting from basically zero fitness because my training peaks graph had gone so low, it was mental to see it. But in reality, what happened was all my fitness that I had banked in the years before, and especially the year before, it really came back fast, like, I was not starting from zero, that was apparent. I could already do two, three, four hour rides, no problems. So basically all the work and training that I'd done in the years before really paid off. It was all work that I had banked and that I could access this year. That I think can be also a powerful message for anyone who's injured or who's not been training for a long time. What I found in my personal experience is that most of the training that I'd banked came back this year when it was required to. And why I think this is important for this video is that this whole structure that is basically only four months of training with two months completely focused, I think it requires some kind of base or you can't really start from scratch for training like in total four months for an Ironman. There must already be some base there and I think it really fits for someone who's doing their second Ironman. If you are doing your second Ironman and you already have a good base, I believe four months can be a good time frame to prepare for it and to get like really specific for it. So all in all, the actual build for the Ironman started on March 16th of 2022 and progressed up until August 5th, 2022. And to give you an idea of the total time, it was bike 81% of the time, total time 183 hours and 39 minutes, total TSS 11,131, run 5.22%, completed distance 131 kilometers, completed duration 11 hours and 49 minutes, total TSS 957, swim 3.71% of the time, completed distance 25 kilometers, completed duration 8 hours and 30 minutes, TSS 574. Then we have strength, which I actually did a lot of in March, and that was completed duration 15 hours of strength, which is pretty good, I believe, in my opinion. And the rest is mostly just hiking, which is around 7 hours of hiking, which is not that much. So starting point for my fitness was 26 on the 16th of March 2022 and we progressed up to a peak of 134 on the 24th of July. On race day we were at 116 on the 5th of August. So that is just to give you some idea of what, what went on. So back to the video. Other tools that I use to get more out of myself in training were, first off, music. Not always, but when I really needed to go hard, I used music, especially on the bike. This would help me sustain a higher paced effort, getting used to the feeling of pushing 
slightly bit harder than comfortable. And I think it paid off in the long run. Eating and nutrition. I shoveled in food as much as I could. Ironman training is absolutely brutal as far as calories go and I just ate and ate and ate. Last time I think during the training I under ate by accident and that compromised a bit everything, both performance but especially recovery. This time no way I was going to let that happen and I actually ended up gaining like one kilogram in inflammation and water weight in the final block. But the most important thing for me was to have the energy to get the sessions done. And I did this by really focusing on not under eating. I shoveled in carbs for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And this time another thing that I changed was to be very mindful of my protein intake. And I supplemented with straight up protein powders, so pea rice and soy, plus essential amino acids. And what I believe I found out in this training cycle was how much carbs plus protein really expedite recovery. So it is something I'm going to do again in the future. Another crucial thing that I changed was mindset. I tried to approach the training with a very positive outlook. This time I had way less insecurities than the first time. The first time everything was new so I didn't I really didn't know if I could do these distances. But this time I already knew the bigger sessions that I needed to do. I knew how they felt so I could actually focus on performing them efficiently and to in some ways enjoy myself. Having the security that comes from knowing that I've already done this, I can do this, really changes everything. If it's your first, I really encourage you to believe in yourself and in your potential and in the fact that you are capable of so much more than you thought is possible. I know it sounds cheesy, but it is the truth. We are capable of so much more than we think we can do, provided that we are basically forced to do it. One tip that I would give is, guys, if you can handle marathon running, do a marathon in training because the marathon is the biggest beast of an Ironman. There is no doubt about it. It's the hardest part. It's the most grueling part. And personally, I didn't do a marathon in training the first time. And I didn't do it the second time because I, I, much, I thought about it and I thought, I need to be on the start line so I cannot get injured. But if my joints were conditioned enough to get a marathon in training, I would do it. I would do it because having the confidence of having done a marathon is really groundbreaking. I believe that anyone who's done a marathon with a proper training block can do an Ironman. Not easily because easily is the wrong word. There is no easy Ironman. It all depends on the intensity you approach it with. But I believe anyone who's done a, a marathon could potentially do an Ironman. No questions asked. One note is the last 45 days I became an absolute obsessed monk. I trained eight and recovered and slept. Basically, that's all I did. The biggest thing I discovered was how much normal day-to-day -day tasks impact recovery. Even just commuting to work, work calls and stresses, meetings with your boss and all this kind of stuff. This led me to another thought. If you have work, family, kids and generally a life, a build like this, in my opinion, can be incredibly tough to handle. What I would advise to do is to dilute the build over more months, maybe four instead of two months of massive build blocks. I would start with doing a baseline week, see what your TSS is, and then work out a plan to be able to reach the highest TSS possible, carving out time for life commitments and figure out how many weeks it will take for it to be challenging, yes, but still being a positive force in your life and a positive addition to your life. What I would emphasize though is that I believe that the concepts of these training blocks, so being guided by TSS, letting training peaks help you, training in zone two most of the time, doing the distances as much to your ability, doing the key weekend, so compressing stuff and getting that race simulation TSS in, I think uh, really key concepts that can help a lot during a training build and can help get the most out of yourself. All in all guys, I'm very happy with how this training went. It really helped me get a better result in the Ironman. I had a lot more fun training this time. So I'm super happy with how it went actually. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope this video was useful to you and that you can take some of these principles and apply them to your training schedule or even just some key concepts. And if you have a coach, maybe integrate some of this stuff into your life. Ironman triathlon training is really a super interesting world, I believe, and I love self-coaching myself. I love self-discovering stuff. Uh, probably I make a lot of mistakes, but I believe that 
having done this a couple of times already and having spoken to some people who know a lot of stuff more than me, I'm really happy with the progression that not only the performance has taken, but the whole training direction has taken. So guys, good luck on your journey. I hope you liked this video. If you liked it, please consider leaving a like or a comment or subscribing to the channel to stay up to date with the next videos, including the full race recap of Ironman Tallinn 2022 which, trust me, it's a kind of an epic story. It's pretty cool. It was a very, very emotional journey. It's something that I will probably remember for the rest of my life. I'm feeling really, really bad, but I'm gonna give this race a shot anyway. So subscribe to the channel if you wanna see that video when it comes out. For now, this is all I've got. This is as in-depth as I could go. If you have any questions on anything that I said in this video, please leave a comment down below. I will try and answer them. And see you in the next video, guys. Thanks for watching.